My name is Richard Parsonson. My most people are from Scotland and England. The Y chromosome on my mother's side, which stops just short of me, goes back 700 years to the founder of the clan Donald on the coast of Scotland. My father's people are on the German-Danish borderlands, and so we have Viking ancestry on both sides. And I feel very lucky to have settled in Fingitani among the Vikings of the Western Hemisphere. I hope I do justice to my ancestors by my work among you. Because I'm new to this work, I know I will make mistakes, and I, I apologize to those who might be hurt by them. I'm very honored to have been asked to moderate this session on place name activism. To be honest, I'm a little frightened by that term activist, activism because I don't consider myself an activist. But I think if we are ethical people, most of us, for most of us, a, a time comes when we have no other choice. And for me, that has happened with the place in the This is a book I originally wrote with Bob Armstrong and Rita Eau Claire in 1992. And it had almost no culture in it. And we're trying to rectify that. So Bob Armstrong and I brought out the third edition uh, in 2014, so two years after um, our grandparents' names on the land. And I requested of my editors, Alaska Northwest Books, that we start a new naming convention. And so in, in this book, I now use the Clinket name whenever it's in the atlas followed by its translation in italic, and then the important white guy name in parentheses behind it. And I anticipated a little resistance from my editors, but they loved it. And they, had, they, they published all over the Pacific Northwest, and they had never done anything like that before. Um, and, and they and I hope that it becomes a more common practice. Um, think of this as, as a seven minute long map. Um, it's something I just did uh, at Outer Point, one of my favorite places. Um, and I confess with the, my reasons for making this had little to do with place names at the time, even though it's just a week ago and I was, should have been thinking ahead toward this conference. But uh, uh, I basically needed to exercise my drone which is, it's kind of like having a dog. My, your drone is sitting over in the corner. Take me outside, take me outside. So I thought, I will take my drone to Outer Point, and we'll fly around, and, and at the same time, we'll think a little about placing it. So that, that's the origin of this thing. But I, I've just heard from both the folks at Sea Alaska Her Heritage and Gold Belt Heritage that both organizations have major new funding that they're, they're all thinking about China touch screens, interactive mapping displays, and imagine walking up to a big screen um, at, at Gold Belt or Sea Alaska with your friends and asking them to take you anywhere in Southeast Alaska at, with, with a map like something like this. So I think uh, I can make it full screen. And I think if, if it works, it's just going to start talking to us. Outer Point is one of Juno's favorite hiking destinations. Whether or not we think about it, one reason is the diversity of habitats and landforms. This was just as true 300 years ago when our reasons included survival as it is today. The trail most of us walk at Outer Point is the first nearest part of the Loop Trail. After that, when the tide's out, we prefer to walk the beach. In this Raven's Eye tour of Outer Point, I'll take you from the public parking pullout through the Beaver Bottom, up into the Dome Bog, and out onto the estuary. Then we'll turn north and finally northeastward 
over the more exposed storm beach and consider why people might have lived here in the peak of the Little Ice Age about 300 years ago. At that time, there were probably no trees on the three-foot-high burn that controls this lush, sedgy parkland with scrub pines and alders. The burn, which today's trail naturally follows, is an ancient beaver dam occupied on and off for many centuries. When the land is mostly draped with dense forest, it can be hard to read the story of landforms created by streams and rivers, changing sea levels, or industrial animals. So let's strip away the vegetation and look at what LIDAR-enabled cartographers are starting to call bare earth. The brown contours here are at 10-foot intervals. My friends and I call this Stickleback Creek. We don't know the Clinket name, but it certainly had one because this is Gunheen, a non-anadromous spring-fed stream, the most non-negotiable element in selection of living sites. From the beaver bottom, a relatively youthful and often disturbed wetland, let's climb 40 feet onto a much older peatland with undecomposed sphagnum moss more than 10,000 years old. We call this a dome bog because it drops off on all sides and has no collection area. These conservative systems have mostly toxic plants, except for berries, and are less valuable to foraging wildlife than productive weapons like the beaver bottoms. The clinket name of the beautiful stream at our point is Kalahinaku, inside a person's mouth, which Europeans replaced with Peterson Creek. Here's Fred White pronouncing the name. I don't know the story behind the name, but the topography is certainly suggestive. In 1946, Jake Crockett said there used to be many gardens here. Back Doug says good southwestern exposure into the warm afternoon sun. Another intriguing name at our point, for which I still don't know the story, is Deshu Ak. Here's Fred White again, distinguishing it from a similar name for Oliver Inlet on Husnu, Admiralty Island. Deshu Ak means little lake at the end of the trail, and Deshu Ak is the little lake of the little lake at the end of the trail. The Portage Trail at Oliver is well known, but what exactly was the trail referred to here at Oliver Point? Estuaries are the world's most fertilized natural habitats by an order of magnitude. They are the breadbaskets of Southeast Alaska, and every one of them was claimed by a Clinket clan. A geologist sees the land like this. The estuary is protected from southerly storms by the fault control bedrock at Oliver Point. But living here, you'd be vulnerable to surprise by enemies rounding that point from the south. So where would you build a defensive fort and elevate a scouting position with the best field of view? Its name was Chicago New, thick-walled fort of logs. Most of the shoreline at our point is either too steep and rocky for canoe landings or too shallow and muddy, except on the highest highs. The obvious best choice for canoes is this mildly sloping gravel beach, like the better known beach at Amstratsu, Nexus Town, off wreck. It appears to have been cleaned of boulders to protect the fragile hulls of Red Cedar Seacraft. Let's cruise this beach at Raven altitude with an eye to canoe landings. Kind of bouldery in the stretch. and even worse on this bedrock section. But here, it's looking great. Not only that, but we've got Green a that stream, that same little stickleback creek that flows through the beaver bottom at the beginning of the loop trail. The downside of this otherwise perfect living site is aspect. It's north facing, and the sun never hits the tree shaded beach in winter. But has that always been the case? Let's go back to the bare earth hill shape. Today, highest highs reach only to this red line. But at the peak of the Little Ice Age, in the 1700s and early 1800s, 
Tides reach up to what we now consider the 32-foot contour. I've colored everything below that bright green. So at the time, this was a suburb of Nexus Town in today's Aquarat. High tide looked more like this. In Photoshop, we can take a 2013 air photo like this one and use the rubber stamp tool to borrow elements from elsewhere to reconstruct what the unforested storm burn looked like and spit enclosed lagoons behind the smokehouses. Is this Deshu Achlu, little lake of the little lake at the end of the trail? In the Gold Belt Heritage Foundation class, Why Do We Live Here, we cored trees on the spit and confirmed that none were likely present when people last lived here. Immediately above high tide, on the lowest supertidal surface, is a band of young red alders. Just above them are Sitka spruce that mostly range from 100 to 150 years old. Stickleback Creek is a tiny stream, but is fed by ponds thanks to damming by storm burns and beaver workings, so it rarely goes completely dry, an important attribute for settlements. In the depths of the Little Ice Age, when icebergs from Auk Glacier drifted up on the Tombolo spit of Shaman Island, this was an uncomfortable place to winter. But today, Outer Point beckons to Genoites year-round. I hope that we'll cherish it even more as we start to understand its history. So as always, we've gone over our allotted time and, and pretty much eaten away any uh, uh, time left over for discussion. Um, uh, I would love to continue this conversation with, with any of you at, at any time, and I really appreciate everyone coming, and thanks so much to all of the people who joined us up here.